Welcome. We are in a series called In Christ. We have, I thought I had a booklet up here. I don't. What did I do with it? I moved it and put it somewhere else. We have, yes, Joanne, hold it up high and proud. There it is. If you're new, you're visiting, whatever, please grab one of those. It will be a guide as we move forward through our series. Please take one and use it to whatever degree you would like. There's blank pages in there. You can draw, you can write notes, you can write Happy Father's Day to somebody and give it to them in case you forgot a card earlier. All sorts of ways you can utilize that, uh, that booklet. Perhaps you'd like to write some things down as we go through this series. Uh, I would also encourage that use. We are now in our third Sunday, and I want to highlight some of these things that we've already talked about. And I'm hoping this will work. Uh, Aaron or Bill, if you could help in the back and advance a slide, please. I want to review just a couple things that we've already talked about. <clears throat> to be in Christ means a lot of different things. We're going to cover a lot of different ground, especially um, in part one where we try to establish uh, some key themes and ideas that come from the Gospels and the New Testament. So the first week we looked at and we said this, to be in Christ means you look to Christ to be saved because you know you're dead if you don't. And then the second week we talked about this. You got another one for me? Oh, that part. All right, there we go. <laughs> all right, good. This will all, it'll all come together. Technology is amazing. It's a gift. Okay, last week, to be in Christ is a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ, not in a relationship with ideas about him, with certain theologies or philosophies or understandings or so forth. No, to be in Christ is you know the person of Jesus Christ. So we've spent some time on that, developing that, and now here's this guy. You can advance it, that's fine. <laughs> it's not a picture of me, right? Anybody know who that is? Jordan Peterson, anybody, so how many people have heard of Jordan Peterson, listen to him every once in a while? Okay, vast majority of you. Uh, a very popular podcast guy, he's on Spotify, he's all over the place. He's got um, series on Genesis and Exodus where he invites scholars in to come and talk about those books. If you've listened to him at all, I've listened to like three or four podcasts, so you probably all know a lot more about him than I do. Uh, but I've just started listening to him. He's intriguing. He's brilliant. He probably has attention deficit issues because he's on rabbit trails all the time. Probably because he's so brilliant. But he never finishes a thought, which drives me nuts. And especially, he doesn't finish a thought when it comes to his own personal spiritual belief. If I'm wrong, correct me later. But I've never heard him say exactly what he believes about Jesus Christ personally. But he's always talking about spiritual things. Have you caught that? And, and people are being drawn, young people, old people, people want to have the discussion. They're drawn into this guy because he's so brilliant and he's willing to talk about things that people aren't. And he has a very high view. Now, I don't know exactly what he believes personally, spiritually, but he does have a high view of the authority of Scripture, how uh, Scripture still speaks today, uh, and uh, who God is, and a number of different things. So anyway, <clears throat> I did listen to a podcast recently that someone told me about, and I was just intrigued by it, sucked into it like maybe you are and some of the things he talks about. And uh, he talked about uh, postmodernism and get into philosophical stuff, and uh, maybe you're part of the you know scary postmodern thinking craze or whatever a few years ago. No, oh, what do we do with this? And now it's just a part of life and how uh, a part of how so many people believe. And uh, he started talking about and explaining the different, as part of postmodern thinking, uh, the, the different stories or narratives that we have uh, and how important that is to all of us in our culture today. Now, <clears throat> the interesting thing about postmodern thinking, uh, believe me, I'm going to move through this quickly here, but stick with me. Uh, that whole story narrative idea is you can basically write your own story. You're in charge of it, not somebody else, not a religion, not a church, not uh, anybody else in your life or so forth. You're in charge of your own story, and your own story, your own narrative can and does you know, become your own truth, your own ultimate truth. Again, nobody enforces that on you. You get to define your own truth in postmodern thinking. Now, he was talking about that with his interviewer, uh, and uh, Peterson's pushback is this. He believes that there is a meta-narrative. Uh, now, as far as I understand, my limited knowledge that most postmodern thinkers don't believe that, but 
Peterson does. So he's pushing back against this guy who is self-proclaimed atheist, not on the same page as Peterson, but he's willing to get into the discussion and, he, and he's digging what he's saying. Uh, Peterson believes there's a, there's a meta-narrative. In other words, there is this overarching narrative. There is a bigger story at work that uh, defines and gives structure to our own individual stories. You with me so far? So a lot of people don't believe that, but Peterson does. So they're going back and forth. They're talking about that and talking about uh, ultimate reality and truth and, and where that comes from. And uh, anyway, so this guy, he says he's an atheist, but he's willing to talk and he's willing to be challenged about what it is that he believes. So Peterson does uh, challenge him a bit about what he believes. And uh, so he brings up examples of evil and he brings up uh, Auschwitz. And, you know, maybe that's the, one, that's the go-to one, but it's a, a, a prime and intense example of evil. So he asks this guy, what about the guard at Auschwitz? The German guard standing there watching all these atrocities happen. Is that guard, is he wrong? Did he do evil by not standing up, by not doing anything where he could have as he's watching the atrocities happen, right? Is he wrong? And quickly, the atheist interviewer says, yes, he's wrong. And uh, Peterson replies, okay, good. All right, we've got, we've got some place to start. Peterson says, you've got a moral pole, like North and South Pole, right? So you've got a, at least a moral pole when it comes to defining evil. So then the question is, who defines it? Do the Nazis? Uh, do you, interviewer, uh, does Peterson, who gets to say where that moral pole of evil belongs? And that's where the interviewer had a harder time discussing these things. The, the one thing that the atheist interviewer goes to is biology. Because I can't believe there's a God, I can't believe that that exists, so it must be just a matter of chemicals and evolution, and we get to the point where we all kind of basically understand that that guy had a moral obligation to stand up for what's right, and he didn't, so he's wrong, and it's just about my, my flesh and bones and cells and, and fluids and whatever my brain does, right? So Peterson didn't buy that, and I don't either, uh, and then the discussion went on from there. So here's why I bring that up. Scripture speaks clearly to what it is that our condition is, and there's more going on with us than just mere biological factors that shape our thinking. Scripture shows us that God has a grand story, that he has a plan. If you want to use the term meta-narrative, I think that works okay, for us this morning, and he is working through that plan, and all of our individual narratives, our stories, fit into or fall under where his grand plan is. Furthermore, I believe that within, embedded in our individual stories, our narratives, are elements of his bigger story that enable him to see uh, or enable us to see God at work and to begin to understand that there's something more to this life. It isn't just about biology and fluids, that there's something more. So that's where we turn to the writer of Ecclesiastes. A few years ago, we went through this book uh, and this fascinating verse right there, chapter 3, verse 11, says this. The author says, He has made everything beautiful in its time, also he has put, God has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. What does that mean? Well, first of all, there's, there's something going on in our hearts that's been planted in us that says it ain't just biology. There's something intuitive, instinctive even, in most people, maybe all people, I don't know, but for most of us it says, ah, oh, there's more. There's got to be something else. I know that that guard at Auschwitz was wrong because there's something more than just biology, okay? And I think, it, whether, whether self-proclaimed atheist guy, interviewer, or whatever, I think most of us will begin to agree on that. But then what does the author say? Yet so, he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. 
In other words, yeah, I know, I know there's something more, but I can't quite get it. I can't quite grasp on to the entire picture. I'm limited. I'm finite, right? I can only see so far. I can only understand so much. God, on the other hand, is not limited. He is infinite. He has the bigger picture. He has laid it all out from beginning to end, and we just see a little piece of it, but it's just enough for our hearts to long for more. What could it be? What is out there? Oh, I wish I could understand more so I could grasp more, so I see my story in the grand design, right? There's got to be something more. So it was interesting to hear these guys talk about it, and it's interesting for us this morning to begin thinking about what is it that's more? How do we begin to move towards believer? Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you spent your life questioning, wondering. Maybe, yeah, there's, there's, uh, instinctively I think there's more, but I, don't, I still don't get it yet. I still don't understand how this all fits together. Does it all fit together? So 2 Corinthians, that's where we're going to be this morning, and a number of other places too. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul lays out his argument for the greatest needs of humanity, the unifying threads, if you will, to all of our stories. Where, what kind of brings us all together? And, and not just humanity in general, but also more, more specifically, I guess this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, what brings those who say, yep, Jesus is my Savior, what ties us together? What are those common threads? So, just a little background, a little context for what's going on in chapter 5. The intern- Paul talks about chapter 5, verses 2 and 4, this internal groaning, okay? There, there's this groaning, it, there's this inside struggle that wants to find or discern uh, that which transcends what the limitations of my life. So he kind of begins there, but he moves on from there, uh, in, in verse 5 of chapter 5, by saying everyone wants something more, <laughs> basically. I'm paraphrasing here. But as believers in Christ, as believers in Christ, we groan specifically for what the Holy Spirit testifies to us inwardly. There is this signal coming up, in other words, for Christians, and that's the Holy Spirit living in us that is testifying. In other words, he's pointing. There it is. <laughs> You're not alone, and you're not left to just flounder, you know, like somebody's sinking in under the waves. No. The Spirit is working in you saying, yep, there it is. Keep moving in that direction. He's testifying to something inside us. And that something more and better begins to take over, at least as Paul describes in chapter 5, he describes kind of a sweet spot that he says he's being controlled, verses 14 and 15, He's being controlled by what? Not by fear, uh, not by confusion. He's being controlled by the love of Christ. He no long, he's so captivated by what the Spirit's leading him, he knows he no longer lives for himself. What, he li- what does he live for? The love of Christ has transformed him so much that he is motivated and captivated and rearranged. Everything's rearranged by the love of God, and he wants to share and show that love to other people. So, we, so let's move on down the chapter here. There's a couple of different therefores. If you look, find therefore, you find out what it's there for. So I already gave you some of it, why it's there. But then we jump into chapter 5, verse 17. There's the therefore. And what does Paul say? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Those in Christ are growing in their understanding of their self and their story, their narrative, that results in seeing everything differently. How? How in the world can we do that? Simply because of this. Everything is different. And that's the radical, transforming message that Paul has in this chapter for us today. Everything is different you, believer, if you are found in Christ, you, he says, are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So what does it mean? 
Let's delve into this just a little bit this morning. I hope it whets your appetite to study more, uh, to live more in what it is that Paul is describing. What does it mean to be a new creation of Christ? Number one, the exile is over. It's done. It's ancient history. A new creation has a new relationship that walks away from the past. Jesus has begun to make everything new. He's starting inside of you and working out from there. So this new creation talk, it's fascinating stuff. New creation talk is not anything new to the Bible. Remember, as Paul pens his letters, what is his Bible? He doesn't have the New Testament. He's writing it. (laughs) What does he have? He's got the Old Testament or the original Testament. And he's trained in the law. He knows the original Testament. So, so many times throughout the New Testament, as Paul's writing, Peter as well, as they're writing, they're quoting and they're drawing our attention back to things that have already happened, things that the prophets have talked about. There's all these links that go back to the original Testament. We cannot fully understand the New Testament unless we begin to grasp what happened before that, okay? So, this is another link. This new creation talk is not something that stands apart. Paul, I think, is drawing our, the, his readers back to new creation talk that happened in the original Testament. This morning, when we read together, as Joanne said, we read from the prophet Isaiah. Prophet Isaiah uh, prophesied for a long time many different kings uh, that were ruling at the time of Isaiah. And towards the end of Isaiah's prophecy in his life, there was an exile. Israel, because of sin and rebellion, rejecting their only God, the true God, they were sent off into exile. And so at the end of the book of Isaiah, there is a talk of what it's going to be like when God brings his people back. Undeserving uh, people who have rejected their God, and yet God had this, this beautiful language, really this poetic, a deep and flourishing kind of language that God uses through the, through the prophet, almost kind of like luring them back into the promised land. Isaiah 65, verse 17. And here's this, you know, another example of this new creation talk that's in the original Testament. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Why is that important? Well, there's at least two different levels that's important. You're going to come back, and it's going to be new. The relationship you have with me, the worship that's going to happen, what I have in store for you is like a new creation. That's on one level, but there's another another level to it, because the heavens and the earth aren't technically new. So he is the prophet, even though I believe he doesn't even know what's going on or how he's describing what he's describing, he is alluding to something in the future that is even yet to come for believers. God in his glory is going to make all things new. So between, uh, on the one hand, the exiles coming back to Israel, that's new, the new promises, the new way they're going to live, hopefully, right, Uh, as the prophet talks about. And the way on the other side, this new thing yet to come that we haven't experienced yet, there's what's happening in the middle, Paul tells us. The newness of what God is doing is going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. All heavens and earth are going to be new someday. But what the kingdom of God is about and what Jesus talked about and what Paul is clarifying is the new happens right here and goes out from there. The exile stuff is in the past. Believer, know this, that whatever happened in the past belongs there. The old has passed away, Paul says. There is something new that Jesus is doing that begins right here. So important that we understand that we cannot, we dare not put ourselves into exile again. Don't live like you belong in the past. It's over. Move forward as a new creation in Christ. Number two, first of all, the exile is over. Christ becomes the center of our story. Christ radically renews and recreates our lives. There's so much more than just um, 
uh, focusing in solely or only on being justified in Christ. That's part of the story, but there's so much more than that. This chapter, chapter 5, is saturated with Paul mentioning Jesus. Mentioning Jesus, mentioning Christ, or mentioning God. Here's your assignment. I'm going to give you an assignment right in the middle of the sermon instead of at the end. Maybe you'll remember it better. I don't know. We'll try it out. So, sometime this week, maybe numerous times this week, take out 2 Corinthians chapter 5, okay? Look through that chapter. Pick one or two or there are numerous times that Jesus is mentioned. Pick all of them, okay? If you got time, it's summer, whatever. Pick as many as you want. Study, meditate what is going on every time Jesus is mentioned and ask, ask yourself, what does that truth, what Paul is describing there, what does it have to do with my story or your story? That's your study assignment. Does that make sense? Pick one or two, pick, pick as many as you want and spend some time thinking about studying what does that have to do with me right now. The old standards, the old viewpoints have expired. They are gone. That's the old stuff. And why does Paul describe that? He says, no longer do we look at each other regarding accord, or according to the flesh. He said even Jesus, we used to consider him according to the flesh. Well, what in the world does that mean? Okay, according or regarding somebody according to the flesh. The new thinking and living that results in being in Christ means that you see others differently. Even the way we understand Jesus becomes different as a new creation in Christ. We don't regard Christ according to worldly, fleshly standards, in other words. In fact, it's actually the other way around. We don't regard Christ according to the world. We regard the world according to Jesus Christ. And that's radical stuff. Believer, if you're confused or frustrated or, or, or don't understand that, that's enough for this morning. What matters if you're in Christ is the new lens, the new way that you understand and see things around you, the culture change, the shifting that maybe makes you irritated or anxious, those things going on, we understand and we look to those things through the lens of Jesus Christ as he has defined us and our new lives and what does that mean for those around us. Is that making sense? That is so huge for us this morning. One other thing, uh, as far as that renewed, I, those renewed ideas, renewed thinking, it means this. Paul, uh, in, in Titus chapter 2, uh, we hear and we read about grace training. Okay, let me uh, bring this up here. Titus 2, verses 11 through 12, we read this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Okay, this dovetails with this idea of being in Christ, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. What enables us, what motivates us to think differently? It's the grace of God at work. It's not an adamant uh, uh, insistence upon being more moral. It just, it falls short every time. I've tried it. Maybe you have two. If you're in that, if you, oh yeah, I get it, right? Hopefully you get it. Let's move on. The training that we need that is really required to live in Christ involves growing in grace, growing in the understanding that I cannot do it on my own. I have failed, but God is worthy. God is faithful. God is sufficient. All the promises that we have in Scripture apply to me ongoing every point, every moment of my life. So here's the point of this. Those who are in Christ should no longer interpret their story. We all have a story, okay? Should no longer interpret our story, your story, by the changing culture around us. Let that sink in. So many of us live in the opposite way. What Jesus spoke of, even in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, so many times Jesus says, you have heard it said, the world around you says this, but I say to you something entirely different. Are we tuning into what Jesus is saying and giving us ways to understand 
what's going on around us? Are we living in that? You've heard it said, but I say to you. Another example, 1 Corinthians. We just went through the book. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Paul says, such were some of you. And there's a list of sins. Okay? He's looking at his church. I know you. I know where you've come from. And I know, at least in part, some of the things that you have done. Such were some of you. Your lives were defined by that. You were in the world. You were in to all of these things that motivated, that shaped your life. And what does he go on to say? But, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you were washed, sanctified, justified. You are set apart in Christ to live differently. From the Gospels forward, all we have over and over again, most of what we have is trying to open our eyes to who we are in Christ and how that Jesus defines our identity. That becomes the foundation point from which we move forward and begin to view and understand everything else. So, this morning you may feel incomplete. You may be a little frustrated with who you are and what's going on in your life. Uh, Maybe confused about your own identity and who am I really? Jesus didn't come to judge that. He came so that you could understand what it is that he has for you. So don't ask what the culture says I should be. Ask what Christ says I already am. Make sense? For you, believer. Don't ask what the culture says I should be. Ask what Christ says I already am. One more thing. What does it mean to be a new creation in Christ? A new order has come. This I love to spend time on. I love to to meditate on, to think about what does this new reality, when Jesus says the new has come, how new is it? How radical, how transformative. If all you've seen in your life, for example, is the same old thing, the same old backdrop, And you are suddenly, you suddenly have revealed to you a whole new reality that's blazing forth in your eyes. What is your response? You know I was born and raised in Iowa. You know there's a whole lot of Iowa that might be considered boring, okay? It's the, a lot of it's the same thing. Corn and beans. Every year, corn and beans. Oh, there's a tree. But corn and beans, right? All of that, born and raised in that. Every once in a while, I get out of my Midwestern shell and see something different. When we visited, and I already had kind of a clue into what was happening, but my family didn't. But when we went to Zion National Park, there is this man-made, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. There's this man-made tunnel that they carved into the rock is really only, before that, there's only one way in and out of this valley. So they made it another way, okay? Man-made tunnel, dark, long tunnel. You come from one side of the park. Well, you know, it's kind of cool, whatever. And you go into this big, long, black tunnel. Every once in a while there's a window, but it's too, it's, you know, too small, you can't see anything. Suddenly, at the end of this tunnel, it opens up. And you see this incredible beautiful valley that just explodes in your face. I love it. If you've ever been there, you have an idea of the miraculous almost transformation from darkness to light and beauty that you have there. What we're talking about spiritually is very similar to that. A new creation that explodes in your mind and your heart that draws you into, can Jesus, can you really be that good? Can my relationship with you really be that fulfilling? For what you've planned for us, can it be that awesome? The answer every time is a resounding, screaming yes. But you gotta get out of Iowa to see it, okay? We just have to. Something I ran across this past week, uh, the new has come. The renewed order that we have, the new creation that Jesus is talking about that starts here and moves outward is putting things back to their created norm. I ran across this um, 
quote, I can't remember where I found it, Jürgen Moltmann, The Way of Jesus Christ, said this, when Jesus, he's talking about the Gospels, what we read about miracles, okay? When Jesus expels demons and heals the sick, he is driving out of creation the powers of destruction and is healing and restoring created beings who are hurt and sick. The Lordship of God, to which the healings witness, restores creation to health. Now, catch this. Jesus' healings are not supernatural miracles in a natural world. They are the only truly natural thing in a world that is unnatural, demonized, and wounded. Think of, just pick an account from the Gospels that you comes to mind. A healing, a miracle, miraculous interaction that Jesus has with people. We read that and, oh, that's, that's unnatural what Jesus does, right? Because miracles don't normally happen. We, nobody experiences that, which it is true, but do you see what he's saying? Jesus is returning things to what they were created to be in the first place. He, the brilliance of God's plan forever is being restored. Sick people become well. Those who cannot walk begin to walk. Those who are blind receive sight. Those who have not have abundance and on and on. What we consider unnatural is because we've been in Iowa too long. <laughs> we need to open our eyes to what truly is natural. It's God's blessing poured out. It's the newness that never ends. I know I've mentioned in the past, but in the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Behold, I make all things new. The language is constantly new. It's ongoing new. It, he never, that's God. That's our God. He doesn't get bored and he's never boring. He just pours out newness because that's the kind of stuff he does. And in our hearts, we get this tantalizing taste of just how new and wonderful God is. And it's just a taste, brothers and sisters. It's just this tiny little taste of what's going to explode in our faces when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords returns and everything is constantly, wonderfully, beautifully new, forever and ever, world without end. Don't you long for that? He placed that in our hearts. So they, we, we would not be satisfied, but playing, as C.S. Lewis says, playing with mud pies, we're going to have a, a, a vacation at the sea. It's crazy. Why do you settle for what is old? The new is come and it's not going to end. That's the beauty of Jesus living in us. That's what we get a taste of as we live in Christ. How does he uh, end chapter 5? I'm going to jump to the end here, okay? Uh, verse 21, for our sake, Paul says this, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What it was imputed onto Jesus was our sin. All of it. All of the ugly, heinous, distorted, warped, rebellion, you name it. It was all put on him. And at the same time, his perfected righteousness is placed on us. In Christ, we become the righteousness of God. And all of these blessings and promises are fully realized. You never in Christ, never stop and wonder, am I good enough today? You don't have to in Christ. You never get tripped up so badly that I don't deserve him anymore. Jesus died for you. Yep, you don't deserve anything he gave. <laughs> he gave it willingly anyway. We are in Christ, defined by Jesus, no longer ourselves. Do you understand that this morning? Do you live in that? Are you found standing in it, in gospel goodness that has changed your perspective and changed your life? He gives us new life. Don't you dare this week regret it, ignore it, instead live in it. Lord Jesus, where we've been sleepy, wake us. Where we've been tired, renew us. Lord Jesus, if we've been 
stuck in a rut where we can't see out, open our eyes again to the glory of your righteousness given to us. Lord Jesus, make us people, men and women, that long for more of you to live in it, to be captivated by the love of God so that others, so we would implore, even beg people, find what I have. Be reconciled to God, as Paul says. Live in that. It's glorious. You don't have to struggle on your own. You don't have to feel alone anymore. You don't have to worry or be afraid. God has given us everything we need richly in Jesus. Live in that. Lord, may we be people set apart to live in you and flourish in you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.